Good evening, church. Last Sunday was about singing. It was not exhaustive. I gave kind of a summary of it. There's always a lot of singing verses that we could talk about. But it was a good summary. Tonight we also are going to give a summary of a subject that that there have been many books written on this subject, but I'm not going to spend months talking about this. So I'm going to I'm going to give you a lesson on this, give you some information. If you want uh, some books to, to read about this subject, then I have some that, that I can give you. Some titles. I'm not going to give you the books. I don't have the books. I do have one book, but it's on Kindle. So I, I don't know how to share that. Do you know how to share that? No, I don't know how to share that either. Um, music and worship. There's been a lot, lots. This title is The Misdirection of Instrumental Music, and so we want to look at First of all, adding musical instrument constitutes will worship. Now, that idea of will worship is a phrase that we looked at in previous lessons to lead us to this point. This is one of the things that we, we look at the scripture and we can find that it talks about the idea of will worship. This is something that we choose to do. It's not something that God told us to do. It's something out of my own desire I, I have chosen to do. And so that, that's what you understand as will worship. Colossians chapter 3 verse 23 says, indeed, these things have an appearance of wisdom in will worship or self-made worship. So you, you look at all of these different things that it talks about with, with um, will worship. It's imposed, self-imposed religion, false humility, um, all sorts of other things that are involved in that. God's word authorizes only vocal music in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. Uh, instrumental music was commanded in the Old Testament. Some people would like to say, well, it wasn't even commanded in the Old Testament, but it was. There are several passages that, that talk about that, uh, but it was also used in pagan forms of worship, so it was, it was something that was very common in the Old Testament times. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verses 13 and 14 said, Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. So it's something that God was pleased with, as far as they were concerned in the Old Testament. And in fact, you could look at Psalm 150, and Psalm 150 tells us in, in various words and, and uses various instruments as a command to do in, in those verses. However, the silence of the apostles and the prophets in, is strong evidence against the use of instrumental music in the New Testament worship. The apostles and prophets wrote from a Jewish background, which had used instruments, yet made no mention of it in the early church. And so it's something that we might think, well, you know, they did this in the Old Testament, so therefore it's obvious that they would go ahead and do this in the New Testament, yet there's no mention of it, there's no command to it, there's no example of it, there's nothing in the New Testament for us to do. So we could consider it, secondly, strange fire. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2 tell us that's what Nadab and Abihu did in the Old Testament times. The sons of Aaron took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. This was something that he had not told them to do. There, there were times when the children of Israel would do things like that. They would do things God didn't tell them to do, and because he didn't tell them to do, to do that, he punished them for it. One example of that is found also out of, outside of the subject of worship. This, this is definitely in the subject of worship because they were offering sacrifices. But you could go to the story where the, the ten spies 
while 12 spies went into the land of Canaan to spy out the land, and when they came back, 10 of them gave a bad report, and two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, we need to go in. And, and finally, the Lord said to the people, no, we're not going to do this. You've disobeyed me. You've dis disregarded my instruction. I told you to go in and spy out the land just to see what it was so that I could give you instructions, but you're disregarding everything that I'm telling you, so I'm not going to let you go into the land. And some people then decided, well, we need to do this because the Lord's punishment for what we, what we would have been able to do is worse than the greatness of his reward if we'd have gone in. Well, they tried to go in, and they tried to fight the people, and they lost, and they lost, and they lost. They were going to be punished for 40 years because they disregarded the will of God, and then they also tried to do what God had not commanded them to do. In fact, what God had told them not to do in that particular case. That kind of thing happened constantly throughout the, New, throughout the Old Testament. It was strange fire. It was not acceptable to God because God didn't authorize that. Thirdly, this also violates scriptural principles. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So when we look and understand what faith is about concerning what we need to believe and what we need to teach, that comes from the word of God. We believe the word of God teaches us what we need to know in order to be saved. You know, there were a lot of questions that were asked about uh, things going on in the, in the sermon and in the Bible classes this morning about John the Baptist and his, and his baptizing Jesus and all of those things surrounding that. And there are a lot of questions that we just have no answers for. There's, there's nothing that we can do to find those answers. We, we just don't know things. That information's not given. But what we needed to know about those circumstances was given to us. And the same thing happens in the New Testament. When we walk by faith and not by sight, we are walking by faith that's based upon the word of God that has been given to us. God wants us to know what we need to know in order to please him and serve him and honor him. And those things that we don't need to know, he doesn't tell us those things. It violates scriptural principles to do something that we don't have the authorization to do. It also invalidates God's word, fourthly. It invalidates God's word. When we do something outside of what God has told us to do, we're disregarding what God has told us to do. We're, we're taking his word and we're setting it aside and we're doing our own thing, invalidating what he's told us to do. An example of that's found in Matthew 15, verses 5 and 6, where Jesus was talking to these people. These people were telling him how that the, the disciples were disregarding his word or disregarding the word of God. And he says, he says back to them, you are disregarding the word of God by changing the tradition. He was saying that the, they were saying that the disciples were not keeping the traditions of the elders or the, 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 the uh, traditions of, of the fathers. And Jesus says, by your traditions, you are breaking the commandments of God. And so he says, for example, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profits you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. And so they had developed a tradition where it was called korban or korban or something to that effect, where what they could do is they could say, well, you know, we would love to help our, our parents who are in need because they're getting older and they can't provide for themselves. However, what we would give to them, we've already dedicated to the Lord. And so therefore, we can't give it to them. In a lot of cases, what would end up happening is they would say that this is given to the Lord, but then they would go and use it themselves anyway. They weren't really giving it to the Lord. They were just saying that it was the Lord's. And then they were 
doing with it whatever they wanted to do anyway. It invalidates God's command to sing. The word music is generic. When you say music, you could be referring to singing or you could be referring to piano playing or uh, sometimes I'll listen to this, this stuff called peaceful piano on, um, what is that thing? All I can think of is Paragould right now, but it's some kind of a show, that, uh, not show, but a app that we can listen to music on and so I'll listen to this and uh, just it's just quiet doesn't have any words to distract me just quiet tunes so that I can work on my my assignments for the kids or they can take a test and and it just be kind of covering up of the noise that goes on in class that's the word music music is singing or playing an instrument of some sort or listening to it but when we say the word sing, when we read the word sing in the scripture, we're seeing a specific word. Playing an instrument is not singing. Playing an instrument is playing an instrument. Singing is using your vocal cords to make a joyful noise. God said to sing, which rejects all other forms of music. So it invalidates God's word when we try to say, oh, God says sing, but we're going to also play. It invalidates his word. So mom says, go to the store and buy some bread and milk. And so we go to the store and buy some bread and milk and a candy bar. That disobeys what, God, what mom said to do. It's invalidating what mom said. Had we asked then maybe mom would have said, okay, you can get a candy bar too. Since you're going to go and you're doing, doing us all a favor, you can do that. But to do that without permission or authorization is invalidating the word of God. The fifth thing is a little bit longer. It's going to take us a little while to go through this. But we ask the question, is it really, really, the, is it really wrong to have instrumental music? Well, I'll give you some thoughts concerning answering this question and I hope that this will help I hope all of this has been helpful so far is instrumental music really wrong when we go into the New Testament we read Jesus teaching and doing things it says in Acts chapter 1 in fact uh, verses 1 and 2 the former account I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So he commanded them to teach the others to do everything that I've commanded you to do. So he, he taught things, he did things, and he taught his disciples what they needed to teach. And in all of that teaching, the New Testament contains the record of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And in all of that teaching, in all of that doing, we never once hear Jesus say for us to use instrumental music. In 2 John verse 9, there's not even a chapter to give to you. It's just several verses in 2 John. Verse 9 tells us, Everyone who does not abide in the teaching of Christ but goes beyond it, does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So when we're going beyond what Jesus has taught, when we're basically adding to what Jesus has taught, we're doing something that he has not authorized. So Jesus did not teach this, and so he did not authorize this. It's not something that he taught, and it's not something that his disciples taught either. The, 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 the apostles did not teach this as well. Matthew 28, verses, verse 19 says, Teach them, telling his disciples, Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. And in all the writings of the New Testament, not one of the apostles wrote for any of his disciples, any of their disciples, any of the people that they baptized to do any of this. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul said to Timothy to teach no other doctrine but that of Christ. And in Paul's teaching, Timothy, of what Christ taught, 
there is no teaching about using instrumental music in our singing. None of it. And so when we listen to the apostles and what they wrote and what they taught and what they taught their disciples to do when they, when they taught them to obey the gospel and taught them everything else that they needed to know, when we listen to what they say, we are, by proxy, listening to what Jesus had to say. Luke chapter 10, verse 16, tells us that very thing. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects God. He rejects him who sent me. God sent Jesus. And so we are rejecting what God has to say when we do this. John chapter 17 verse 8 says, For if I have given to them the words which you have given to me, they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So the disciples understood what Jesus had to say and that he came from God and that he was teaching them what God had taught, told him to teach them. So the very words that the disciples or the apostles were teaching are the words from God through Jesus. In verse 14 he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. So the world will try to get us to do whatever the world wants us to do. And anything that Jesus says, they're going to hate that idea. And they're going to disregard what he has to say. But if we want to follow Christ and we want to worship God the way Jesus wanted us to worship God, then we need to leave it out. We need to let it go. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, "...who also has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant." And not of the letter, referring to the Old Covenant, but of the Spirit. For the letter, the Old Covenant, kills, but the Spirit gives life. So we start listening to the things of the Old Covenant and start doing what they say. Because, well, the Old Testament did it, so why can't we do it in the New Testament? The Old Testament killed. The New Testament gives life. And it's the teachings that we need. Further, it's not taught by the Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 13, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to, he will tell you things to come. So did the Spirit ever tell the disciples or the apostles to teach anybody about instrumental music so that they would use that in their worship. No. Not once. In John 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, from whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Did they ever bring it up? That the Holy Spirit reminded, oh yes, Jesus said we should play a harp or we should play a piano or we should play some kind of stringed instrument or play a trumpet. Not one time had that ever been said. The Spirit did not guide, teach, or bring them to remembrance to use instrumental music in worship. And therefore, no one is led by the Spirit to use it in worship. Further, it's not found in truth. True worship must be confined to the items of worship contained in truth. So we've looked at what Christ said, what the apostles said, what the Spirit said, what God said, and all of the things that were said were written down. And we now have those in the New Testament writings called the Gospels and the Letters and the Book of Prophecy. And in the truth, John 1, 7 says, The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so when we look to the truth of the word of God, 
do we see that in there? Are we commanded to do that? Are we commanded not to do that, someone would say? Yes, because we are commanded to sing. And that excludes or rejects any other method of music. We are commanded to sing. God's word given to Christ and the apostles, guided by the Spirit, wrote it down, and now we can read it. So we know what we need to do. Well, what about music in heaven? Because Revelation says there was music in heaven. Roman, Revelation 12, uh, 14, verse 2 says, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. That's the New King James Version. And probably the King James Version will say it like that. But interestingly, every other translation, every single one, all of those newfangled translations that all of those people that believe in instrumental music have translated, all of those, all of those, translated differently. How is that translated? It's like this. The voice I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. It wasn't harpists playing their harps. It was like the sound, the voice of that sound was like harpists playing their harps. John heard one thing, singing. And that singing was like many waters that gave the rhythm, great thunder that gave the volume, and harpers that gave the melody. He heard singing that was like all of that. Can you imagine, when you look at the text saying that there were such a great number in heaven, so many that nobody could number them, and then there were the 12 tribes of Israel describing to us, also in figurative language, that says all Israel will be there. But if we went by the number... 12,000 in each tribe, 12,000 times 12 is 144,000 people, plus the number that we can't even count. People singing. Can you imagine what that would sound like? I've been in a place where it seems like there were 10,000 people, but let's Let's just say I was wrong and there were only 5,000 people there. It was a big, big crowd of people. And we were singing, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. And we were singing, I don't know, there is a God. And we were singing, we're marching to Zion. And all sorts of songs, all of us singing it was amazing yes we had someone leading us but you could hear everybody singing together following the leader so that we could all sing together all of these various parts in harmony together we were singing no piano no guitar no instrument of any sort we didn't need it it was amazing the singing that was going on. We don't even need it. We don't even need it. What we need is for each individual person, as I mentioned last Sunday night, what we need is for each individual person who is in the auditorium when we are singing as a congregation, we need each individual person to sing because we are singing and encouraging one another in our relationship and love for one another but also in our praise to God and that's all God asked us to do so let's sing what's our last slide speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord let's do that it's a lot easier. We don't have to pay for getting the piano tuned or anything. 
And my understanding is you have to have that done every two or three months, maybe less. I don't know. Those of you that know all about that, let me know. Or don't. You don't have to. All I know is it's just a lot easier. Let's just sing. We're going to sing a song of encouragement right now. And if you need to respond to the gospel invitation to repent of your sins and be baptized, then don't put it off. Come to the invitation. If you need our prayers as a brother or sister in Christ, don't put it off. As we sing this song, let us encourage you to come back to Christ. So if you need to respond, please do so while we stand and sing this song.